afternoon, Dr. Ferrer. We have about a minute. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health today, January 13th, for a media briefing. Today, we have the Director of Public Health, Dr. Barbara Freer, and the Los Angeles Board of Supervisors Chair, Supervisor Holly J. Mitchell, presenting. Both Supervisor Mitchell and Dr. Freer will take your questions after the briefing. But to ask a question, uh, please use the hand icon or you may chat me the host. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, I believe you're kicking us off when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much to Dr. Ferrer and the LA County Department of Public Health for inviting me to again participate in today's press briefing. It's an important opportunity for us to engage our media partners to help us get critical messaging out to every Angelino, our nearly 11 million residents. Uh, I know the Department of Public Health and Department of Healthcare Services are working hard to expand locations and hours of testing sites. Um, you know, DHS has restarted the PCR home test kit pilot for in-person pickup and drop off in parks and the option to mail in the test and get results within 24 to 48 hours. Dr. Ferrer may expand upon that, but that's an important element um, that we've kicked off again starting yesterday, January 12th, to allow people to get those PCR tests, the home test kits. You know, as I think about the significance of the next several days, you know, on Monday, we'll all be celebrating and commemorating the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And, um, you know, one of my favorite Dr. King quotes, Dr. Ferrer, is his comment about health care. And I quote, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane because it often results in physical death. And we are currently experiencing this. This pandemic has not affected LA County residents equally. And so I and the entire members of the Board of Supervisors are committed to continue to ask hard questions about health equity and to get the resources those in most need deserve and should be entitled to. Um, I know that people are um, over COVID and, and, and its uh, granddaughter, Omicron. <laughs> um, and we're exhausted by this pandemic, but we have so much work to do. Dr. Ferrer, I'm sure we'll update everyone on our current shocking numbers from this week. But I really want to appreciate our media partners. I think last week I asked you to help us to talk about encouraging people not to go to the emergency room to get tested and literally every New station I turn on every article I pick up, I see uh, healthcare professionals and you helping us get the message. So I'm going to continue to ask you to step up and help us. And I think my 1 key message I would ask that you pick up and, and push out this week. Is to really encourage people to cancel or just to not attend unnecessary. Indoor gatherings to stay at home as much as possible, because it will allow us to do all that we can to slow the spread. I'm unmasked today because I am in my district office in Expo Park alone. Uh, my staff is working remotely to continue to meet the needs of LA County residents and my constituents. Um, and so unnecessary indoor gatherings, either cancel them, don't go, or limit the amount of time you're there, and certainly mask up. Dr. Ferrer will talk about once again the appropriate masks. I get concerned when I see school kids uh, uh, walking the streets and they're still wearing cloth masks. And so making sure that everybody understands the, the uh, importance of wearing our mask properly and what masks offer us the most protection, the medical quality mask. Again, Dr. Ferrer will go into that with her slides. So thank you again. We need your support and partnership to continue to push out accurate, timely information. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. Uh, thank you so much and, and uh, good afternoon. Um, 
everyone and, and thanks as always Supervisor Mitchell for your leadership and continued advocacy as we face the surge in Omicron across our county. I'm grateful for an opportunity to present to you and the public the latest on the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this morning, I'm going to first provide an update on our current cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, uh, followed by an update on our most recent vaccination data and on schools with the resuming of in-person learning after the winter break. And I'll end with a review of isolation and quarantine requirements and strategies on how we can all try to stay safe uh, during the surge. Uh, I'd take the next slide. As you can see on... On this slide, uh, new cases re remain extraordinarily high. Uh, we're trending between 35,000 and 45,000 uh, new cases per day for this entire week. Uh, and as we expected, we're also seeing the associated increases in hospitalizations and now in deaths that typically follow a rise in cases. Daily hospitalizations of confirmed cases are now well over 4,000. Uh, as of today, and this is the highest number since last winter's surge. Uh, and daily deaths, as you can see here, have more than doubled uh, in recent days from earlier in the week, uh, with 45 new deaths tragically being reported today. As always, we send our condolences and our prayers to everyone who's grieving the devastating loss of a loved one from COVID-19. Uh, finally, uh, test positivity has also remained high at about 21% on average meaning that more than one in five people getting tested is infected with COVID. Our daily case rate has also increased just one and a half times just in the last week alone, from 271 new cases per 100,000 residents to today, 408 new cases per 100,000 residents. And this is what surge looks like. I'll take the next slide. Uh, and you can see uh, on our trend lines, looking at new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths between July 1st of last year uh, and January 12th, uh, what, uh, what this, how this looks different uh, from where we were earlier in the year. The rise in cases represented by the green line at the top is nearly a straight vertical line, increasing by over 2,000% from fewer than 1,000 new daily cases at the start of December to more than 35,000 new daily cases this week. Similarly, hospital admissions, which is the orange line, is also following a significant upward trend, increasing by more than 600% since the start of December, from less than 600 hospitalizations to now over 4,100 hospitalizations. With the most recent uptick in deaths over the last couple of days, we're unfortunately worried that we're going to start seeing that blue line also begin to rise in the weeks ahead. It's important to note that hospitalizations and deaths are typically lagging indicators, and it, takes, it often takes several weeks after cases increase to see corresponding increases in these outcomes. The sad thing is once we see these increases, they're likely to continue for a few weeks after cases plateau or begin to decline. And while it's reassuring that much of the scientific evidence to date suggests that Omicron causes milder illness for many people, particularly those vaccinated and boosted, we still have no idea what percent of those recently infected with Omicron will experience long COVID or the likelihood of children infected with Omicron developing MISC after their initial infection. Given this uncertainty, it remains prudent to continue to take all the protections possible to minimize your exposure to this highly infectious variant. Next slide. Protecting our hospitals remains a high priority during the surge so that access to care for those with any serious illness is not compromised. On this slide, you can see the total countywide hospital census in red at the very top, and below it is the daily average COVID hospitalization census in orange, spanning from September of 2020 through January 11th of this year. COVID hospitalizations in orange, as you can see, markedly increased over the last month by more than 2,000 additional hospitalizations, and you're now seeing an associated up and up trend in the LA County hospital census over the more recent weeks, with a daily census of 15,000 hospitalized patients. At the peak level of last year's winter surge, when most hospitals were frankly overwhelmed, 
hospital census reached nearly 16,500 patients. So we are not far away from that peak. Next slide. This slide shows the proportion of all ICU patients who have had COVID-19 through January 11th. Again, we see a significant trend upward with COVID patients now making up nearly 25% of all of the ICU patients uh, or one in four of ICU patients. And this is higher than we, we observed, as you can see, during the Delta surge, which peaked at about 20% of patients in the ICU being COVID patients last summer. However, this upward trend is still far less than the peak that we saw last winter during last winter's surge when COVID patients made up nearly 70% of all of the ICU patients. Next slide. When looking at the total ventilated patients with COVID-19, we also see the parallel rise in the proportion with the uptrending light purple line. This means that Omicron is causing not just an increase in the overall census at hospitals, but it's also driving increases in the proportion of ICU and ventilated patients. And while thankfully this is not at levels that we saw during last winter's surge, these numbers do serve as a stark reminder that for a growing number of people, Omicron is causing severe illness. Next slide. One important point in understanding uh, COVID uh, hospitalizations is knowing whether the hospitalization was in fact due to COVID or if COVID was simply incidental to the hospitalization. As we noted last week, many of the COVID positive patients hospitalized are seeking hospital care for a non COVID related health issue, such as care for chronic conditions, including heart or kidney disease. Because all patients are tested for COVID on admission, the increase in hospitalizations reflects the higher rates of community spread. But it also, as you can see here in the orange line, represents a percentage of hospitalizations that are in fact due to COVID illness. Now, while this number has decreased from nearly 75%, which was pre-Omicron of COVID positive hospitalized patients to now 60% of those patients, this is indeed a stress on the healthcare system. Uh, it does mean, however, that slightly more than 40% of the currently hospitalized COVID positive patients are actually in the hospital receiving care for non-COVID illness. I do want to call your attention to the green line, which highlights the fact that these estimates are highly dynamic and influenced by, by when the analysis was able to be done. This green line, this represents the analysis that we did and showed last week. We did it at an earlier point in time. It shows a lower estimate for the percentage of COVID-associated hospitalizations because the data are based on diagnoses recorded at the time of hospital discharge. Because patients with COVID-associated illness are likely to be hospitalized for a longer period of time than patients with incidental COVID, any recent estimates are likely to underestimate the number of, the number of COVID-associated illness hospitalizations and overestimate the number of incidental hospitalizations. So we're going to continue to monitor the trends over time to better understand the burden of COVID disease among hospitalized patients. And we'll share these updates with you. The other thing I want to note is that COVID positive patients, regardless of the reason for their hospitalization, all require resource intensive precautions, including isolation rooms, cohorted staff, and personal protective equipment. And this does continue to represent a substantial strain on the healthcare system, particularly in light of the staffing shortages uh, that are happening at all of our hospitals. Next slide. I do as always want to update you on what we're finding with our sequence specimens uh, here in LA County. The yellow bar uh, represents Omicron and the red bar represents Delta. Uh, please note that there are always delays in sequencing that affect the totals for the most recent week. Nonetheless, it's really clear that Omicron is now crowded out Delta. And for the most recent week, ending January 1st, approximately 95% of all of the sequence specimens to date were Omicron. Next slide. While cases have risen dramatically among all residents, as you can see on this slide, the steepest increase continues to happen in infections among those who are unvaccinated. For the week ending January 1st, there were approximately 
2,800 new cases per 100,000 unvaccinated individuals. That's represented by that dotted line. Compared to about 1,500 cases per 100,000 fully vaccinated without boosters individual, individuals, and that's the dashed line, kind of dashed line. And 750 cases per 100,000 fully vaccinated individuals who had boosters, which is represented by the solid line. For the week ending January 1st, these fully vaccinated but unboosted individuals were almost two times less likely to get infected than unvaccinated people. And among those who were fully vaccinated and boosted, they had even more protection as they were nearly four times less likely to get infected than those unvaccinated. So while Omicron does evade some of the vaccine protections, our data continues to show that vaccines and boosters make a difference. If more people were vaccinated and boosted, we would not see this many cases. Next slide. Like the patterns we noted among those uh, most likely to get infected, there are even more pronounced differences in hospitalization rates based on vaccination status. The top dotted line here represents a significantly higher rate of hospitalization among unvaccinated individuals. And as you can see here, it has steeply increased with Omicron. Far below it, far below it, is the dashed line of the fully vaccinated without boosters individuals. And then at the very bottom of the graph, there's this tiny solid line that represents hospitalizations among those fully vaccinated with boosters. Note that because we just recently attained enough data on hospitalizations among boosted individuals, this solid yellow line is a short segment that's barely visible at the end of the chart primarily because almost no boosted and vaccinated individuals are hospitalized. When we compare the most recent rate of hospitalization for the unvaccinated ending the week of January 1st, the rate is nearly five times higher when compared to those who are fully vaccinated without their boosters, and nearly 20 times higher when compared to those who are fully vaccinated with boosters. Next slide. We can also, as always, look at our deaths by vaccination status, and here the pattern has been consistent. Those unvaccinated have substantially higher rates of death than the fully vaccinated. The death rate among those unvaccinated, shown here by the dotted line, is approximately five and a half deaths per 100,000 people for the week that ended December 21st, 25th. Among the fully vaccinated, and that's with the solid line at the very bottom, the death rate is so much less, at approximately less than one death per 100,000 people for the same period. This means that unvaccinated individuals are approximately 20 times more likely to die from COVID-19 when compared to those individuals that are fully vaccinated. The protection vaccinated individuals have has held steady over the past few months, even as Omicron now dominates. Because increases in deaths, however, generally lag behind increases in cases and hospitalizations, we do anticipate that there will be more deaths in the weeks ahead. Unfortunately, it's highly likely that almost all the future deaths will be among those not fully vaccinated. Next slide. As we note the power of vaccinations against severe illness and death, we have reached several key milestones as of January 9th. Over 77% of residents 12 and older are now fully vaccinated. 80% of county residents five and older have received at least one dose, and nearly 90% of residents 65 and older are fully vaccinated. While we continue to be grateful to everyone who's getting vaccinated and boosted, there nonetheless remain almost 2 million eligible residents who have not yet received their first dose of vaccine. And this includes 655,000 children between the ages of 5 and 11. Unfortunately, this creates substantial vulnerability across LA County, since as we just saw, this unprotected group continues to have substantially higher rates of infection and serious illness when compared to those who are vaccinated. And with the essential protection offered by the booster dose, it's urgent that the 3.1 million residents 12 and older currently eligible for boosters who have not yet received their additional dose try to not delay any longer getting up to date on their vaccinations. Next slide. On this chart, first doses administered each week are represented in blue, while second doses are in yellow and additional or booster doses are in orange. 
Last week, we administered approximately 314,000 doses across the county. This is an increase from the preceding two holiday weeks. The majority of these doses, as you can see here, 210,000 were for boosters, 60,000 were first doses, and 44,000 were second doses. Next slide. Along with vaccinations, testing uh, has been another important tool for layering in protection for virus transmission. And while we do have a significant capacity issues that we're facing across the county, I want to applaud all the school districts uh, because uh, all schools across the county since last fall have implemented testing strategies to reduce transmission at their sites. This slide shows school testing volume represented by the blue bars across LA County since last August. The drop in testing volume uh, in late November and late December was due to the holiday breaks. Last week, with the return of in-person learning and school-based testing, more than 540,000 tests were conducted uh, during the week that ended January 9th. The increased circulation of Omicron has resulted in a dramatic increase in the test positivity rate among students and staff, which reached almost 15% last week. And that's noted on the purple trend line that you could see on this graph. This translated last week to 80, over 80,000 positive cases, including about 68,560 cases among LAUSD staff and students. Uh, and as, as we noted, uh, LAUSD did in fact um, begin all of their uh, in-school testing, school-based testing program last week. Prior to Omicron, student and staff weekly test positivity rates were generally extraordinarily low at approximately 0.2% of those tested at schools. You can barely see it on this graph. Next slide. Importantly, most of the positive cases identified at schools, even with Omicron, are the result of transmission that has happened elsewhere. Transmission in schools is characterized as an outbreak when there are three or more cases linked to a known exposure at a school or at a school activity. As of January 11th, public health is currently responding to about 26 active school outbreaks uh, with three new outbreaks over this past week. All of the outbreaks identified over the past three weeks, as you can see here, represented by these yellow bars, occurred in youth sports. This is uh, most likely because schools were closed for the winter break, but sports activities continued. With explosive community transmission and the significant rise in cases, we do anticipate that during this surge, there will also be more outbreaks at schools. This is similar to the dramatic increases in outbreaks we're seeing across all other workplace sectors. Uh, as always, strategies for limiting spread during outbreaks rely on compliance with isolation and quarantine, attention to infection control, and the wearing of well-fitting masks that provide maximum filtration. We'll take the next slide. In response to this latest surge, uh, public health is working closely with the LA County Office of Education and all the school districts to support safety measures for staff and students. One of the biggest needs is to be able to expand testing capacity. By the end of today, over 1.4 million test kits, uh, these are over-the-counter test kits, provided by the state, thank you to the governor's office and the department, the California Department of Public Health, uh, they will have been distributed to 84 school districts and more than 300 charter schools. Contracted testing capacity is also being increased at hundreds of parochial and private schools. As we're working closely with our school partners to increase capacity for continued uh, routine and response testing on school campuses, I wanna note how important it is for anybody who's testing positive with one of those kits that they took home to notify the school that that child is positive so that the appropriate next steps can be taken. And anybody who tests positive, as a reminder, uh, does need to remain home during their isolation period. Uh, next slide. Our schools are also taking extra steps and precautionary measures to mitigate during the surge. This includes revisions to exposure management to support keeping as many students and staff safely in school. By January 17th, all school staff will be issued medical grade masks, such as surgical masks or an N95 or KN95 respirator. 
Students are also advised to wear upgraded non cloth masks of multiple layers of non woven material with a nose wire that fit well. And we'll be scheduling our mobile vaccine teams to schools to make it easy for parents, students, and staff to get their first or their second or their third dose. Vaccinations help us keep our children safely in schools where they can thrive and learn. Next slide. As many know, we recently updated and modified isolation requirements for persons in LA County with COVID-19. These requirements that I'm gonna go over apply to everyone except healthcare personnel, and they are aligned with the state. Uh, but in a couple of significant ways, they are different from CDC. I want to reiterate, these are the requirements in LA County and across the entire state of California. Persons are considered to have COVID if they've had a positive viral test or their healthcare provider thinks that they have COVID-19. And everyone, every single person who's infected with COVID is required to remain at home away from others for at least five days. This is uh, the only exception to this are for healthcare workers. Everybody else has to stay home for at least five days. To exit isolation after day five, you need to meet some criteria. The first is you're gonna need a negative COVID-19 viral test that's collected on day five or later. It needs to be negative, and this should be an antigen test. You'll need to have no fever for at least 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medicine before you leave isolation. And you should be without symptoms or your symptoms should be significantly improved. If you don't meet these criteria, you'll need to exit isolation after day 10, again, provided you have no fever for at least 24 hours uh, before leaving isolation and you're asymptomatic or your symptoms are significantly improved. You also need to wear a well-fitting medical grade mask around others, both indoors and outdoors for the full 10 days. This is particularly important for those that are exiting isolation after day five. And it means that because you need to keep that mask on the entire time you're around other people, you should not be eating or drinking with anybody else and you should not be going to places where you're gonna have your mask off. We do ask that people who are infected tell their close contacts that they have been exposed and that they need to follow the instructions for close contacts. And your close contacts are anyone that you came in touch with 48 hours before you either develop symptoms or you had that positive test. If you test positive and you have any questions or you need some help, please call the Department of Public Health. Seven days a week, we're open for your calls, positive people. Uh, this is from 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. And you can call us at 833-540-0473. Next slide. We've also modified quarantine requirements for people in LA County who are exposed to COVID-19 and need to quarantine. These requirements apply only to those individuals with an exposure who are unvaccinated, incompletely vaccinated, or not up to date with their COVID-19 vaccine. And again, they do not apply to healthcare workers. Uh, you need to stay home for at least five days after your last contact with a person who was positive with COVID. You can end your quarantine after day five only if you have no symptoms and you've had a COVID-19 test, and this should be an antigen test, collected on day five or later, that's negative. If the test is not done on day five or later, or um, symptoms are, and symptoms are not present, quarantine can end on day 10. If you've been exposed, uh, regardless of whether you're quarantining or you're not, you need to be sure to monitor your health for 10 days. If at any time symptoms develop, you should test and stay home. You also need to wear that well-fitting medical grade mask when you're around others for 10 days after your last exposure. I wanna note that besides healthcare workers, there are two other important exceptions here. The first is for employees who are not healthcare personnel. These are non healthcare employees who are asymptomatic and fully vaccinated, but they are not necessarily boosted. They needed to get boosted and they're not yet boosted. These folks can continue to work on the condition that they get a viral test 
three to five days after that last exposure to the infected person and that the result is negative. They can work uh, while they're waiting the, for those results, uh, but somewhere between day three and five, they need to get tested and that result needs to remain neg to be negative for them to not have to, uh, obviously if they're positive, go into isolation. You'll need to wear a well-fitting medical grade mask whenever you're around others indoors and outdoors for the total of the 10 days. And again, not eat or drink around others. You need to continue to have no symptoms and you need to quarantine at home when you're not at work. So this is a pass to go to work, but not to go to a party or to go to a restaurant or to go to a movie. Uh, this is a, to allow folks uh, who need to be at work but uh, and are fully vaccinated, but not yet boosted, although they needed to be boosted uh, to stay in a work environment. The other exception is for students uh, in grades TK through 12. They also can attend school during their quarantine period if they're fully vaccinated and not yet boosted, or if they qualify for a modified quarantine that may be offered by their school. So those are two exceptions in addition to healthcare personnel on quarantining. We'll go to the next slide. Now, for those who have no symptoms, they're in that exception group, or they're up to date uh, on all of their COVID vaccines, or they've recovered from lab confirmed COVID-19 within the last 90 days. These are folks who are exempt from quarantine should they, uh, be, clo should they be a close contact to an infected person. However, even if you're exempt, if you're in one of these groups, you do need to monitor your health for 10 days if symptoms develop, you know, please go home and test. If you test positive, you need to then follow the isolation requirements. And as we noted earlier, you need to wear a well-fitting medical grade mask around others for the 10 day quarantine period. Whenever it's possible, anybody who's identified as a close contact should try to test as soon as they can after their exposure. And again, if possible, test again around day five. This is particularly important if you yourself or someone you live with is at increased risk for severe illness. The exception to this is for those who recently recovered from COVID-19. These individuals uh, testing is not recommended unless you develop symptoms. Next slide. In closing today, I do wanna acknowledge how challenging it is to figure out what is best to do when so many are ending up getting infected. And while we have tools that help, there is growing frustration over the seemingly endless changes in guidance, the short supply of tests, and the reality that those vaccinated and boosted may also become infected. Since this is an accurate assessment of our current reality, I think we'll need to uh, remind ourselves that we've survived similar challenges multiple times over the past two years. And while it's not where we had all hoped to be at this moment in time, we're gonna to need to find our reserves and continue to do our very best to slow the spread. It is way too risky for too many people to not continue to take precautions and to make those strategic decisions that minimize unnecessary exposures. We need our schools and workplaces to remain open. And this is most possible if we continue to work together and take sensible precautions. For starters, there is still time to get vaccinated and boosted. Please don't delay any longer. With these very high levels of transmission, getting vaccinated and boosted when it's your time to get boosted is one of the best ways to not just protect yourselves from COVID, but at this time to help us get back to slowing the spread. Unvaccinated people are between two and four times more likely to get infected than those who are vaccinated and therefore two to four times more likely to be spreading the virus. Given high rates of transmission, upgrading your mask for a good fit and filtration will also add a layer of really critical protection during Omicron. N95s, KN95s, KF94s, uh, these are the best when it comes to blocking COVID virus particles, but medical grade or surgical masks also work well. And frankly, a cloth mask is so much better than no mask at all. We've asked everyone to limit non-essential activities where the risk for transmission is high. These include those activities that are indoors and crowded with unmasked individuals. 
And although testing is in short supply, it's important that those with symptoms or known exposure uh, try to find a way to get tested. Uh, you know, please call your provider and visit us on covid19.lacounty.gov to find a testing site. Um, and if you do test positive, again, you can call us at 833-540-0473 uh, for some help. But I do want to note uh, what the supervisor started with, which is that there has been a dramatic expansion of testing capacity in LA County. So I know many people two weeks ago uh, couldn't find any place to get tested, but I don't think that's the case anymore. So please go to the website. Uh, and if you have a, a medical provider, contact your medical provider for help, particularly if you have symptoms or you've had a known exposure. Thank you. And now the supervisor and I are happy to take your questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, go ahead and use the hand icon or you may chat me the host. Our first question comes from Steve Gregory with uh, iHeartMedia KFI. Steve, you're unmuted. Hi, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Barbara. Great to talk with you. Happy New Year. Happy um, New Year. I, I, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, herd immunity. I, I, did I miss any of that in there? And, and where are we at with that? I mean, it's a great question, Steve, um, because obviously, as, as many people have noted, with so many people getting infected, uh, they will have uh, some form of immunity uh, from COVID for at least a short period of time. I mean, again, with Omicron, we don't have enough data to know how long that immunity is going to last. Uh, in the past, particularly with Delta, it was very clear that uh, vaccination was going to provide you with longer lasting immunity than uh, becoming infected. Uh, but you're absolutely right to note that we've got lots and lots of people who have been infected uh, over the past month and will have some natural immunity uh, for most people because our vaccination numbers are high here. That will be on top of uh, their vaccine and the protection they're getting for their vaccines. For others, it may be their only uh, source of some immunity. And again, we would encourage those folks, particularly since we have no data yet on, on how long that immunity will last uh, with Omicron, if you were infected with Omicron, to go ahead and get vaccinated as well. Uh, you know, as, as we've said in the past, there's no magic number on herd immunity. It really means when there's so much immunity in the community and, and generally everyone agrees, you know, you're, you're talking, you know, 80, 85, 90% of people have that immunity. Uh, that makes it really, really hard for a virus uh, to spread. So we're not there, that's clear. Um, and as we've just all noted, um, unfortunately with viruses that mutate, uh, the immunity you have, for example, from Delta may not protect you at all from Omicron. Uh, and even uh, with our excellent protection from vaccines, uh, it's not quite as powerful a protection as we had before. So it's always a changing landscape. Uh, and you know, the best we can do is uh, apply all the extra layers of protection in addition to getting vaccinated and boosted. But thanks, Steve. And happy new year. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Ron Lynn from the LA Times. Ron, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Ferrer and Supervisor Mitchell. Thanks so much for being available today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Ferrer, our questions today are uh, for you, uh, our advice on the Lunar New Year, the timing of the peak, uh, geographic trends, and, and deaths by variant. So first, with the Lunar New Year coming on February 1st, you know, considering your guidance suggesting non-essential gatherings be postponed, would you recommend against holding multi-generational dinners in homes with like 20 people that include grandparents and grandchildren? I understand indoors is riskier than outdoors, but is outdoors too risky too? Second, do you have a sense of when we might hit our peak? Third, are you seeing any geographic or demographic trends relating to the current spread like we saw during earlier surges? And then finally, um, Dr. Walensky, the CDC director, recently speculated she thought most of the recent deaths were still due to Delta, not Omicron. Do you have any idea how many of the recent deaths are related to Delta versus Omicron? Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, uh, so let me just start with the last question um, uh, on the recent deaths. Uh, I, I think Dr. Walensky is right. Um, you know, deaths are a lagging indicator. Many of the people who unfortunately passed away, and as you know, the deaths we reported uh, yesterday, I, I had a chance to look at all of those records. Those were all people who died in January. So it wasn't like, you know, sometimes we have a lag in the reporting of deaths, but 
that wasn't what we were seeing with these high numbers yesterday, and I anticipate it's the same today. But as you note, uh, many people are, are sick for quite a while, and many are hospitalized uh, for quite a while before they pass away. So it is likely that most of the deaths uh, we are seeing are still uh, related to, to Delta, although not entirely. Because then again, you know, there are some people who get really, really sick very quickly uh, and, and uh, unfortunately pass away fairly quickly. Uh, but the the fact is that, you know, we've had a rise in hospitalizations that's been going on now for a few weeks. Uh, and we always know that after those increases in hospitalizations, uh, we will see an increase uh, tragically uh, in the people who pass away. Uh, in terms of the demographics on the spread, uh, you know, this is really just looking at the cases. Um, there are some interesting, um, there are some interesting trends that we've started looking at. Uh, one is that there's a lot of spread that's happening around, uh, in more affluent communities. Uh, one reason uh, why those case numbers may be high, though, uh, we think is related to people's access to testing. Um, so uh, many people in, in the more affluent communities uh, were, are able and were able, uh, certainly a while back, to go ahead and purchase those in-home test kits, which are quite expensive, um, and are also able to drive around uh, to go ahead and get tested. Um, so, uh, you know, as always, um, the inequity of sort of resources that people need to get through this pandemic uh, rear their ugly head uh, when we look deeply at, at what's going on. And, and I fear that uh, we have, again, uh, introduced uh, inadvertently uh, over the past uh, few weeks uh, with the difficulties. It's, it happens every time there's some scarcity with the difficulties in, in getting those tests. Uh, it's been easier for people with more resources. Uh, to be able to get hold of a test. Uh, so we're seeing some higher rates. I also think some of those higher case rates are uh, folks who had more resources, did more traveling, uh, took vacations in places where there might have been more exposures, got on airplanes, uh, and tend to, uh, you know, uh, again, be able to go to restaurants and entertainment venues at a greater, at a higher rate than people with less resources. So given that this is a virus that spreads easily when you're in crowded situations with other people, uh, we're not really surprised to see uh, a slight shift at this point. It's really early on in the spread of Omicron, uh, but we'll continue to track that and, and probably in the next week or two, we'll devote some time at one of our briefings to taking a, a good look both at geographic distribution and distribution by, by race and ethnicity. Uh, the timing of the peak, I, I wish I could answer that for, for you and for me. <laughs> Um, I wish I had that crystal ball, uh, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, we could look at New York. We can look at Washington, D.C. We could look at what's going on in the U.K. and London in particular um, and get a sense that similar to South Africa, you know, we have these huge increases uh, and then uh, there seems to be a plateauing uh, and then there is a decline. I can say one thing for sure is we are still increasing. Um, so uh, we're not we're not plateauing. Uh, the numbers today are 45,000. That's not a plateau. Uh, that's an increase. Um, and uh, and if you look at our our trend lines, you'll see that it's a, a pretty steep increase still. Um, we're hopeful uh, that uh, with everybody particularly paying a lot of attention to what they're doing, and this is why we ask people to sort of minimize. Uh, the ability to spread this virus is because it helps us all to get this back under control as quickly as possible. Uh, we're hoping that, um, you know, again, we will follow a similar trend to New York City, Washington, D.C. A plateau and then start a steep decline uh, within a matter of, of a couple of weeks, but no way to predict that at this point. Um, and uh, that probably gets to the last question, uh, which is, Given that we're in the middle of surge, uh, what's the advice uh, for Lunar New Year's? I, I mean, in my mind, uh, I'm crystal clear when there's this much transmission, and it will take a while for transmission to drop really low. People who are at high risk really need to avoid non-essential activities uh, with others. Like, it just doesn't make sense um, to go to parties uh, if you're an older person, if you're a person with serious underlying health conditions, if you've got uh, any kind of... Uh, immunity uh, health issues, you know, you're immunocompromised in any way. Like, this is just the time uh, to really be very cautious about what you're doing uh, to protect yourselves, because spread is so easy. 
Um, on the other hand, there, there are people who aren't in those groups. They're fully vaxxed and boosted um, and they want to do something outdoors and they're going to be able to distance themselves and they're going to keep it small. Uh, and that will, that will be okay. Uh, it's those larger gatherings with people you don't know, especially indoors, uh, where you have high risk people unvaccinated is the other group of high risk people. They should really be avoiding gatherings of any kind. Um, but for folks who are vaccinated and boosted or up to date on their vaccines, uh, they're going to have a small gathering. They're going to be outside. Um, I think again, with precautions, uh, that, that is something that. Uh, again, uh, make it as safe as possible, be outside, spread out, uh, and don't be crowded, and don't have people at higher risk of, of getting infected. Uh, hopefully, by the time we get to the Lunar New Year, our testing capacity will have improved, and I think, uh, similar to the guidance we issued uh, over the holidays, the being able to test before you gather is a really good idea, particularly if you're gathering with people at higher risk. Of, uh, of serious illness, uh, and that includes, you know, unvaccinated children. Um, so hopefully, I, Supervisor Mitchell, anything to add there? I think oh, you're man, you hit it all. <clears throat> okay. Okay, we can take the next question. Great. Our next question comes from Margaret Carrero from KNX. Margaret, you're unmuted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Supervisor Mitchell for taking all of our questions today. Dr. Ferrer, a few questions for you with regard to um, testing in close contacts. Is a rapid test enough uh, for people who have had a close contact but have no symptoms? Um, also, there's a lot of these uh, pop-up testing sites that we're seeing, these ones with like these blue tents. Um, who's making sure that those are legit? Um, and also your thoughts on asymptomatic hospital workers who test positive for COVID staying on the job due to staffing shortages. Okay, <laughs> let, me, um, let me, let me just uh, get these down. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so um, testing, um, uh, testing, if you're quarantining, you have no symptoms. So just as a reminder, the people who are quarantining uh, and testing, uh, the people who are quarantining uh, are people who are not fully vaccinated. Um, so I just, I just want to make sure that, that we all understand if you're fully vaccinated, you do not have uh, a requirement, fully vaxxed and boosted, uh, unless you're going to work, uh, you do not have that requirement to quarantine. But we do, we do suggest uh, that people who are close contacts, if you can, you get a test both on right away, as soon as you find out you're a close contact, and then again on day five. That's because the reason why we tell people to test right away is there's really no way of knowing who the index case is. For all you know, you're asymptomatic, but you gave it to that close contact. So that's a reason why we, we always suggest that people test right away. Now, you're right to note that with people with no symptoms, uh, you know, a, a PCR test is the test that is much more likely to be able to pick up very small amounts of virus, while an antigen test is a really good test to pick up uh, when you have a, a significant enough viral load that you're likely to be infectious. Um, so if you have the ability to get that PCR test, uh, then, you know, by all means, go ahead. For those people who are trying to exit quarantine uh, after day five, because they have no symptoms, they're going to want to use that antigen test just because they're going to get that result within 15 minutes, as opposed to waiting the two days that it's going to take to get your PCR test. In terms of uh, those testing, those pop-up testing sites, you know, we, we, there's no way for us to, to actually be everywhere where, where, where testing sites pop up. I want to say that 99% of the pop-up testing sites in LA County are legit. Um, and that if you uh, talk to the people at the sites, it's pretty easy to figure out which sites are legit. You can ask them if they're, you know, what, what test, what test product they're using. Is it, is it approved by the FDA? Uh, you can ask if they're affiliated with any other organization. Um, do they have a community uh, based organization that's helping them? Um, and you can look around and make sure that what you're seeing is uh, looks like a, a healthcare facility able to manage uh, infection control and proper collection of testing samples. So we've all been testing now for, you know, uh, over over well over a year. It's uh, for many people uh, even closer to two years. Um, and I think uh, people have a, a reasonable sense of how to actually uh, be able to figure out uh, whether something's legitimate. I, I will also say that most of the legitimate testing sites 
do not require you at all to pay cash. So it should be a, a pretty big red flag if someone tells you they need cash. Uh, some sites do collect your insurance information so that they can bill your insurance. Uh, but most sites uh, do, I mean, I don't know of any reputable site that requires you to pay cash. So if someone is asking for cash, uh, you might want to go find, uh, find a different site. The second thing I'll say about the testing, though, is please go to our website um, and look at the testing sites listed on our website. The testing sites on that website are, in fact, testing sites that are reputable. So when in doubt, you can check on the website and see if that pop-up site in your neighborhood uh, is on our list. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not reputable if it's not, because the pop-up sites do exactly that. They travel around and they pop up. Uh, and I will say that the vast majority of those are reputable. If you think you found a site that's not reputable, uh, we ask that you call that in to the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs uh, because they will investigate and uh, they will shut down sites, obviously, uh, that are not uh, appropriately uh, able to uh, do testing. Uh, in terms of your last question about uh, the ability uh, that was given to healthcare personnel and, and healthcare facilities um, during surge by the state uh, to modify the quarantine isolation requirements. Uh, I want to start by saying that, that that is an extreme measure to be used when the choice you're facing is not being able to provide life-saving services uh, or bringing back asymptomatic people uh, who may either be infected or, or needed to be quarantined. And I don't know of any institutions that are lightly going into that space. There's a requirement that you exhaust every other option in front of you. Your registry, you haven't been able to find the folks at the registry. So it isn't um, something that any institutions are doing lightly. But I think there are, at this point, uh, huge capacity strains uh, that really mean the difference in many cases of being able to, as I noted, provide life-saving services in emergency rooms, uh, to people who are extraordinarily sick, um, and uh, and and that flexibility is something uh, that many institutions uh, really requested uh, and may find necessary for very short periods of time as we try to get through the next couple of weeks. But I think, and and I think uh, everyone shares this uh, this sentiment with me. Wherever possible, people who are infected, as I noted before, should be isolating for that minimum period of five days. Um, and, uh, and I think there's nobody who disagrees with that. I think it's when there are these extenuating circumstances where you have to make a really tough decision about which risk is worse. The risk that you can control when you bring back somebody who's positive and they're in an, a respirator and you're really trying to limit their uh, contact uh, with others that would lead to any kind of exposures or, or, or spread, or you're closing down uh, life-saving services that we all depend on. So. I, I really, I want to flip that question just a little bit to say, you know, for everyone who cares about our healthcare workers, like if you really care about our healthcare workers, you're getting vaccinated and boosted and you're, you're absolutely avoiding unnecessary exposures. I mean, that is the way to show your love. That is the way to be respectful of people who have given us everything uh, for the past two years. Um, and uh, if, if we want our healthcare system to, to really uh, not get stressed out. Uh, we need people to get vaccinated and boosted and not end up needing care for COVID uh, in our hospitals. So, uh, but we can take, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, our final question comes from Howard Bloom from the LA Times. Howard, go ahead. Hi, thanks for squeezing in this question. I had a little bit of, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of families who are confused about quarantine rules related to schools. And I'm a little confused too sometimes because people are trying to update it and get the, get it right. I understand that. The state just came out with new updated quarantine guidelines for schools. And I'm wondering to what extent is the county going to follow these new state guidelines and how are they different from compared to the previous guidelines, just so that we can explain this to people and understand it ourselves. Yeah, thanks so much, Howard, uh, and, and a really important question. You know, late last night, the state did issue new guidance. We're still looking at their new guidance. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't get it ahead of time. Um, so we're still reviewing it. As you know, uh, we needed to issue new guidance to our schools earlier because schools were really struggling with managing the high number of positive cases that they had and 
exposure management strategies uh, switched uh, quite a bit earlier this week. Uh, I, I am, you know, I did talk with superintendents this morning. I'll be talking uh, with the folks at the LA County Office of Education later on today as we sift through uh, the state guidance to see where the differences are and what makes most sense for LA County. I, one thing I, I know about where I think uh, one of the, the biggest differences is, is around uh, quarantining, uh, quarantining uh, folks who have had an exposure at schools. Uh, and how to deal with that, given the limited test capacity uh, that many school districts uh, really, particularly, I mean, we do quite well here in LA County, frankly. Uh, we have lots of systems in place, but across the state, that is not uh, evenly distributed, that, that testing capacity at schools. Um, so we're going to take a look at, at what they proposed. Uh, as, as you know, whenever possible, we do try to stay in alignment uh, with the state, but we also uh, need to recognize you know, our obligation uh, to create a lot of safety uh, here in LA County. Uh, I, I want to really commend the, the superintendents, the staff, the teachers, the union partners, the, te the students and the parents, uh, because we got through the fall with uh, really, I think, one of the lowest rates of in-school transmission of any place in the entire country. And that just happened because there was a lot of work uh, that went on in our schools to really adhere to a set of requirements that made a lot of sense and kept transmission uh, really, really low. And that benefited everybody. And that does keep kids ultimately in school learning. Uh, so we have a shared goal here, but give us a little time uh, to take a look at that. We will be back out, you know, probably at the end of this week, uh, early next week uh, with any modifications we might need to make in light of what the state just issued, but I don't really have the answer yet because we really just got it last night. So that concludes our question portion of the briefing. If there are additional questions, you can send them to us at media at ph.lacounty.gov. Uh, final words from Supervisor Mitchell and Dr. Ferrer. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer, for um, always uh, keeping it real. <laughs> Uh, and helping us understand the changing dynamic of this virus. I think that last question was great, and I look forward to hearing your clarification about if quarantine rules are going to change. I heard you loud and clear uh, in board meeting Tuesday when you stated that you know schools, quite frankly, are the safest place for our kids right now. And and many of the districts here in LA County have done all they can. You know, you led during the holidays to make sure they had home test kits. I believe the test kits we were waiting to come from the state have arrived. And so they're testing and that's a good thing. So I look forward to getting the clarification from the changes of the state. And thanks for including me as always. Oh no, thank you so much for your support supervisor. And we'll talk to folks next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the Spanish portion of the briefing will begin in just a few minutes.
Monica, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, excellent. Uh, I have your slides ready to go. Are you okay to begin? Yes, I am. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Spanish portion of today's briefing. Today is January 13th. We have Monica with us. Uh, Monica, when you are ready. Okay, thank you, Kim. Eh, buenas tardes. Hoy daremos una actualización sobre nos, nuestros actuales casos de hospitalizaciones y, y muertes. Luego hablaremos de datos de vacunación más recientes y sobre las escuelas eh, con el regreso a la instrucción en persona después de las vacaciones de invierno. Y terminaremos con una revisión de los requisitos de aislamiento y cuarentena junto con información sobre las pruebas y cómo todos podemos mantenernos seguros durante este pico de la pandemia. Uh, first slide, please. Como pueden ver en esta diapositiva, los casos nuevos siguen siendo extremadamente altos, con una tendencia de entre 35,000 y 45,000 por día durante la última semana. Y como era de esperar, también estamos viendo los aumentos asociados en hospitalizaciones y muertes que suelen seguir. A partir de hoy, las hospitalizaciones diarias de casos confirmados han superado las 4,000 hospitalizaciones, el número más alto desde el aumento repentino del invierno pasado y las muertes diarias se han duplicado eh, en los últimos días con respecto a principios de semana con 45 nuevas muer muertes trágicamente reportadas hoy. Como siempre, enviamos nuestras condolencias y oraciones a todos los que están de duelo por haber perdido a un ser querido debido a COVID-19. Finalmente, la positividad de la prueba se ha mantenido muy alta, en alrededor del 22%, lo que significa que casi uno de cada cuatro personas que se hacen la prueba se han infectado con COVID. Nuestra tasa de casos diarios también ha aumentado una y media veces en la última semana con 271 casos nuevos por cada 100,000 residentes a 408 casos nuevos por cada 100,000 residentes. Next slide, please. Esta diapositiva muestra nuevos casos, hospitalizaciones y muertes entre el 1 de julio del año pasado y el 12 de enero. El aumento de casos representado por la línea verde en la parte superior es casi una línea vertical recta, aumentando en un 2,346% de menos de, de 1,000 nuevos casos diarios a principios de diciembre a más de 35,000 nuevos casos diarios esta semana. Del mismo modo, los ingresos hospitalarios en la línea naranja siguen una importante tendencia al aumento, ya que se incrementaron en más de un 600% desde principios de diciembre, con menos de 600 nuevas hospitalizaciones a 4,175 nuevas hospitalizaciones. Con el aumento más reciente de muertes en los últimos días, lamentablemente es probable que comencemos a ver que la línea azul también aumente en las próximas semanas. Es importante tener en cuenta que las hospitalizaciones y las muertes suelen ser indicadores rezagados y a menudo y estos números aumentan solo después de varias semanas ya que aumentan los casos para ver los incrementos correspondientes en estos resultados. Una vez que veamos estos aumentos es probable que continúen durante algunas semanas después de que los casos se estabilicen o comiencen a disminuir. Y si bien es tranquilizador que gran parte de la evidencia científica a la fecha sugiere que Omicron causa una enfermedad más leve en muchas personas, particularmente en aquellas vacunadas y con refuerzo, aún no sabemos qué porcentaje de las personas recientemente infectadas experimentarán un COVID prolongado o la probabilidad de que los niños desarrollen síndrome inflamatorio multisistémico después de una infección inicial con Omicron. Dada esta incertidumbre, sigue siendo prudente seguir tomando medidas de protección para minimizar la exposición a esta variante altamente infecciosa. Next slide, please. Durante este aumento de casos, la protección de nuestros hospitales sigue siendo una alta prioridad para que no se vea comprometido el acceso a la atención de las personas con enfermedades graves. 
En esta diapositiva el rojo en la parte superior vemos el censo hospitalario total de todo el condado y debajo en naranja el censo promedio diario de hospitalizaciones por COVID que abarca desde septiembre del 2020 al 11 de enero de este año. Las hospitalizaciones por COVID en naranja han aumentado notablemente durante el último mes a más de 2,000 hospitalizaciones adicionales y en las últimas semanas también estamos viendo una tendencia ascendente en el censo de hospitales del condado de Los Ángeles, con un censo diario de 15,000 pacientes hospitalizados. En el mismo nivel máximo del aumento invernal del año pasado, cuando la mayoría de los hospitales se vieron abrumados, el censo hospitalario llegó a, a casi de 16,500 pacientes. Next slide, please. Esta diapositiva muestra la, propor la proporción de todos los pacientes que al 11 de enero estaban en las unidades de cuidados intensivos debido al COVID-19. Una vez más, vemos una tendencia significativa al aumento de pacientes con COVID, quienes ahora representan casi el 25% de todos los pacientes que están en urgencias, o uno de cada cuatro más alto de lo que observamos durante el aumento de Delta, que alcanzó un máximo del 20% el verano. Sin embargo, esta tendencia al aumento de casos sigue siendo mucho menor que el pico observado durante el incremento re, re, repentino del invierno pasado, cuando los pacientes con COVID representaron casi el 70% de todos los pacientes en urgencias. Next slide, please. En la línea violeta clara ascendente se observa que el total de pacientes con COVID-19 a quienes se les debe poner respirador ha tenido un aumento paralelo, paralelo en la proporción. Esto significa que Omicron está provocando no solo un aumento en el censo general de hospitales, sino también aumentos en la proporción de pacientes con respirador y en urgencias. Y aunque afortunadamente no se encuentran en los niveles observados durante el aumento repentino del invierno pasado, estas cifras sirven como un claro recordatorio de que para un número creciente de personas, Omicron está causando enfermedades graves. Next slide, please. Un punto más importante para comprender las hospitalizaciones por COVID es saber si la hospitalización se debió al hecho eh, de que COVID o si COVID fue simplemente incidental a la hospitalización. Como señalamos la semana pasada, muchos de los pacientes positivos con COVID hospitalizado buscan atención hospitalarias por un problema de salud no relacionado con COVID, como la atención a afecciones crónicas, como enfermedades cardíacas o renales, debido a que al ingresar al hospital a todos los pacientes se les hace la prueba de COVID, el aumento de las hospitalizaciones refleja las tasas más altas de propagación comunitaria. Como puede ver aquí en la línea naranja, antes de Omicron, el porcentaje de hospitalizaciones debido a la enfermedad de COVID disminuyó de casi el 75% de pacientes hospitalizados positivos por COVID a menos del 60% de esos pacientes ahora. Esto significa que un poco más del 40% de los pacientes actualmente hospitalizados con resultado positivo de COVID están realmente en el hospital recibiendo atención por una enfermedad que no es de COVID. Queremos llamar su atención sobre la línea verde, que destaca el hecho de que estas estimaciones son muy dinámicas y están influenciadas por el momento en que se realiza el análisis. La línea verde, que representa un análisis realizado anteriormente, muestra una estimación más baja del porcentaje de hospitalizaciones asociadas con COVID porque los datos se basan en diagnósticos registrados en el momento en que la persona se da de alta. Debido a que es probable que los pacientes con enfermedades asociadas con COVID sean hospitalizados por un periodo más largo que los pacientes con COVID incidental, es probable que cualquier estimación reciente subestime la cantidad de hospitalizaciones por enfermedades asociadas con COVID y sobreestime la cantidad de hospitalizaciones incidentales. Continuaremos monitoreando estas tendencias a lo largo del tiempo para comprender mejor la carga de la enfermedad COVID entre los pacientes hospitalizados. Por último, los pacientes positivos por COVID, independiente del motivo de su hospitalización, 
requieren precauciones que exigen muchos recursos, incluidas salas de aislamiento, organización de turnos entre el personal y equipo de protección personal, lo que representa una carga sustancial para el sistema de atención médica, particularmente a la luz de la escasez de personal en todos nuestros hospitales. Next slide, please. En esta diapositiva vemos los datos más recientes de las variantes secuenciadas aquí en el condado de Los Ángeles. La barra amarilla representa a Omicron y la barra roja representa Delta. Tenga en cuenta que siempre hay retrasos en la secuencia que afecta a los totales de la semana más reciente. No obstante, está claro que Omicron ha desplazado a Delta. Durante la última semana que finalizó el 1 de enero, pues aproximadamente el 95% de todos los especímenes secuenciados fueron Omicron. Next slide, please. Si bien los casos han aumentado dramáticamente entre todos los residentes, como puede ver en esta diapositiva, el incremento más pronunciado de infecciones se ha visto entre los que no están vacunados. Para la semana que finalizó el 1 de enero, hubo aproximadamente 2,800 casos nuevos por cada 100,000 no vacunados representados por la línea punteada en comparación con aproximadamente 1,500 casos por cada 100,000 totalmente vacunados sin refuerzos representados por la línea discontinua y 750 casos por 100,000 totalmente vacunados con refuerzos representados por la línea sólida. Durante la semana que finalizó el 1 de enero, las personas que recibieron todas las vacunas pero que no recibieron refuerzos, ca tuvieron casi dos veces menos probabilidades de infectarse que las no personas no vacunadas. Entre los que estaban completamente vacunados y con refuerzo, tenían aún más protección, ya que tenían casi cuatro veces menos probabilidades de infectarse que los que no estaban vacunados. Y aunque Omicron evade algunas de las protecciones de las vacunas, los datos siguen mostrando que las vacunas y los refuerzos marcan la diferencia. Si más personas fueran vacunadas y recibieran el refuerzo, no veríamos tantos casos. Next slide, please. Al igual que los patrones que notamos entre los que tienen más probabilidades de infectarse, existen diferencias aún más pronunciadas en la tasa de hospitalización según el estado de vacunación. La línea punteada superior aquí representa la tasa significativamente más alta de personas no vacunadas y como puede ver aquí, ha aumentado considerablemente debido a Omicron. Muy por debajo está la línea punteada de los vacunados por completo sin refuerzos. Y luego, en la parte inferior del gráfico, la línea continua que representa las hospitalizaciones entre los vacunados y con refuerzo. Tengo en cuenta que debido a que recientemente obtuvimos suficientes datos sobre las hospitalizaciones entre las personas con refuerzo, esta línea amarilla sólida es un segmento corto apenas visible al final del, del gráfico. Cuando comparamos la tasa de hospitalización más reciente de los no vacunados al final de la semana del 1 de enero, la tasa es casi cinco veces más alta en comparación con aquellos que están completamente vacunados sin refuerzos y casi 20 veces más alta en comparación con aquellos que están completamente vacunados con refuerzo. Next slide, please. Cuando observamos las muertes por estado de vacunación, el patrón es consistente. Los que no están vacunados tienen las tasas de muerte sustancialmente más altas que los que están completamente vacunados. La tasa de mortalidad entre los no vacunados que se muestra aquí con la línea punteada que terminó el 25 de diciembre fue aproximadamente 5,5 muertes por cada 100,000 personas. Entre los completamente vacunados que se muestran con la línea continua, la tasa de mortalidad fue mucho menor, aproximadamente menos de una muerte por cada 100,000 personas para el mismo periodo. Esto significa que las personas no vacunadas tienen aproximadamente 21 veces más probabilidades de morir de COVID en comparación con las personas que están completamente vacunadas. La protección que tienen las personas vacunadas se ha mantenido constante durante los últimos meses, incluso ahora con el dominio de Omicron. Debido a que los aumentos en las muertes generalmente van a la saga de los incrementos en los casos y las hospitalizaciones, anticipamos que habrá más muertes. 
en las próximas semanas. Desafortunadamente, es muy probable que casi todas las futuras muertes se den entre aquellos que no están completamente vacunados. Next slide, please. A medida que notamos el poder de las vacunas contra enfermedades graves y la muerte, hemos alcanzado varios hitos clave desde el 9 de enero. Más del 77% de los residentes de 12 años y más están completamente vacunados. El 80% de los residentes del condado de 5 años y más han recibido al menos una dosis y casi el 90% de los residentes mayores de 65 años ahora están completamente vacunados. Si bien seguimos agradecidos por todos los que se han vacunado y han recibido su refuerzo, aún quedan casi 2 millones de residentes que reúnen los requisitos pero que no, aún no ha recibido su primera dosis de la vacuna, incluida la cantidad de 655 mil niños entre las edades de 5 y 11 años. Desafortunadamente, esto crea una vulnerabilidad sustancial en todo el condado de Los Ángeles, ya que, como acabamos de ver, este desprotegido grupo continúa teniendo tasas de infección y enfermedades graves sustancialmente más altas en comparación con los no vacunados. Y con la protección esencial que ofrece la dosis de refuerzo, es urgente que los 3,1 millones de residentes mayores de 12 años que actualmente reúnen los requisitos para recibirlo, pero aún no lo han hecho, tra traten de no atrasar más el día para recibir sus vacunas. Next slide, please. Este en este cuadro, las primeras dosis administradas cada semana están representadas en azul, mientras que las segundas dosis están en amarillo y las dosis adicionales o de refuerzo en naranja. La semana pasada administramos aproximadamente 314 mil dosis, un aumento con respecto a las semanas de celebración de las festividades. La mayoría de estas dosis, 210 mil, fueron de refuerzo. 60 mil fueron primeras dosis y 44 mil fueron segundas dosis. Next slide, please. Excuse me, perdón. Junto con las vacunas, las pruebas han sido otra herramienta importante para la protección contra el contagio del virus. Desde el pasado otoño, las escuelas de todo el condado han implementado estrategias para administrar pruebas con el fin de reducir la propagación. Esta diapositiva muestra el volumen de pruebas escolares representado por las barras azules en todo el condado de Los Ángeles desde el pasado agosto. La caída en el volumen de pruebas a fines de noviembre y diciembre se debió a las vacaciones. La semana pasada, con el regreso de la instrucción en persona y la administración de pruebas en las escuelas, se realizaron más de 54 mil pruebas durante la semana que finalizó el 9 de enero. El aumento de la circulación de Omicron ha resultado en un gran aumento en la tasa de positividad de la prueba entre los estudiantes y el personal alcanzando el 14,7% la semana pasada, que se observa en la línea de tendencia morada en este gráfico. Esto se tradujo la semana pasada en 80,424 casos positivos, incluidos 68,560 casos entre el personal y los estudiantes del Distrito Unificado de Los Ángeles. Antes de Omicron, los índices semanales de casos positivos con base en las pruebas de los estudiantes y el personal era generalmente extraordinariamente bajos, aproximadamente el 0,2% de las personas que se hicieron la prueba en las escuelas. Next slide, please. Es importante destacar que la mayoría de los casos positivos identificados en las escuelas son el resultado del contagio que ocurrió en otros lugares. La propagación en las escuelas se caracteriza como brote cuando hay tres o más casos y vinculados a una exposición conocida en la escuela o en una actividad escolar. Desde el 11 de enero, Salud Pública ha estado respondiendo a 26 brotes escolares activos, con tres nuevos brotes la semana pasada. Todos los brotes identificados durante estas últimas tres semanas, representados aquí por las tres barras amarillas más recientes, ocurrieron en deportes juveniles. Esto probablemente se debe a que las escuelas estuvieron cerradas para actividades académicas durante las vacaciones de invierno. 
con la explosiva propagación comunitaria y el aumento significativo de casos, anticipamos que durante este aumento repentino también habrá más brotes en las escuelas. Esto es similar a los aumentos dramáticos en los brotes que estábamos viendo en otros sectores laborales. Como siempre, las estrategias para limitar la propagación durante los brotes se basan en el cumplimiento de los requisitos de aislamiento y cuarentena, la atención al control de infecciones y el uso de mascarillas bien ajustadas que brinden la máxima filtración. Next slide, please. Como respuesta a este último aumento, Salud Pública eh, está trabajando en estrecha colaboración con la Oficina de Educación del Condado de Los Ángeles y los distritos escolares para apoyar las medidas de seguridad para el personal y los estudiantes. Una de las mayores necesidades es ampliar la capacidad para suministrar pruebas. Para el final de hoy se, habr, se habrán distribuido más de 1,4 millones de juegos de prueba proporcionados por el Estado a 84 distritos escolares y más de 300 escuelas charter. También se está aumentando la capacidad de prueba en las escuelas parroquiales y privadas. Y estamos trabajando en estrella colaboración con nuestros aliados escolares para aumentar la capacidad de continuar haciendo las pruebas de rutina y de respuesta en los planteles escolares. Next slide, please. Nuestras escuelas también están tomando pasos adicionales y medidas de precaución para mitigar el contagio. Esto incluye revisiones al manejo de la exposición para ayudar a mantener seguros a tantos estudiantes como al personal de la escuela. Uh, para el 17 de enero, todo el personal de las escuelas recibirán mascarillas de grado médico como una mascarilla quirúrgica y un respirador o un respirador N95 o KN95. También se recomienda a los estudiantes que usen una mejor marca, mascarilla que no sea de tela, con múltiples capas de material no tejido y con un alambre a la altura de la nariz que se ajuste bien. Y programaremos nuestros equipos móviles de vacunas para que vayan a las escuelas para facilitar que los padres, los, los estudiantes y el personal reciban su primera, segunda o tercera dosis. Las vacunas nos ayudan a mantener a los niños seguros en las escuelas donde pueden prosperar y aprender. Next slide, please. Como muchos saben, recientemente actualizamos y modificamos los requisitos de aislamiento para personas en el condado de Los Ángeles con COVID-19. Los requisitos se aplican a todos, excepto al personal de atención médica y están alineados con los requerimientos ordenados por el Estado. Se considera que las personas están infectadas con COVID-19 si tienen una prueba viral positiva y o oh, su proveedor de atención médica cree que tienen COVID-19. Todas las personas infectadas con COVID deben permanecer en casa, lejos de los demás, durante al menos cinco días. Para sal salir del aislamiento después del quinto día, Necesitar una prueba viral de COVID-19 negativa obtenida el quinto día o después. Tampoco debe tener fiebre durante al menos 24 horas sin el uso de medic medicamentos para reducir fiebre y estar asintomático o con, con, si los síntomas han mejorado. Si no cumple con estos criterios, puede salir, de la, puede salir del aislamiento después del décimo día siempre que no tenga fiebre durante al menos 24 horas sin el uso de medicamentos para reducir la fiebre y esté asintomático o sus síntomas mejoran. También debe usar mascarilla de grado médico que le quede bien cuando esté alrededor de otras personas, tanto en interiores como en exteriores durante 10 días. Esto es particularmente importante para quienes salen del aislamiento después del quinto día. Le pedimos también que informe a sus contactos cercanos que han estado expuestos y que deben seguir las instrucciones para contactos cercanos. Si da positivo, tiene preguntas o necesita ayuda, siempre puede llamar al Departamento de Salud Pública los 7 días de la semana entre las 8 de la mañana y las 8 y 30 de la noche al 833-540-0400. 73. 
Next slide, please. También modificamos los requisitos de cuarentena para las personas en el condado de Los Ángeles que están expuestas al COVID y necesitan ponerse en cuarentena. Estos requisitos se aplican a todas aquellas personas no vacunadas, vacunadas pero no con todas las dosis o que están al día con su vacuna contra el COVID y hayan estado expuestas al virus. Deben quedarse en casa durante al menos cinco días después de su último contacto con una persona infectada con COVID-19. La cuarentena puede terminar después del quinto día solo si no hay síntomas y una prueba viral de COVID-19 hecha el quinto día o después es negativa. Si no se realiza la prueba el quinto día o después y no hay síntomas, la cuarentena puede terminar después del décimo día. Si ha estado expuesto, asegúrese de monitorear su salud durante 10 días. Si en algún momento se desarrollan síntomas, realice la prueba o quédese en casa. También deberá usar mascarilla de grado médico que le quede bien cuando esté cerca de otras personas durante 10 días después de su última exposición. Aquí hay dos ex excepciones importantes. La primera es para los empleados que no son personal de salud. A los empleados que no son de atención médica, que son asintomáticos, se les puede permitir continuar trabajando con la condición de que se haga la prueba viral tres, cinco días después de su última exposición a la persona infectada y el resultado es negativo. Y usen mascarilla de grado médico que les quede bien, idealmente una N95 o KN95 cuando esté alrededor de otras personas en interiores y exteriores durante un total de 10 días y no coma ni beba cerca de otras personas. Sigan sin tener síntomas y hacer cuarentena en casa cuando no están en el trabajo. Los estudiantes de transición a grado 12 también pueden asistir a la escuela durante su periodo de cuarentena si están completamente vacunados y sin refuerzo o califican para una cuarentena modificada que puede ofrecer su escuela. Next slide, please. Aquellos que no tienen síntomas y están al día con todas las vacunas contra el COVID-19 o se recuperaron de un COVID-19 confirmado por laboratorio en los últimos 90 días, están exentos de la cuarentena en caso de que tengan un contacto cercano. Monitoree su salud durante 10 días. Si se desarrollan síntomas, por favor, quédese en casa y hágase la prueba. Si da positivo, deberá seguir los requisitos de aislamiento. También use siempre mascarilla de grado médico, aunque que le quede bien cuando esté alrededor de otras personas, durante el periodo de cuarentena de 10 días. Siempre que sea posible, todos los contactos cercanos deben intentar hacerse la prueba lo antes posible después de su exposición y nuevamente alrededor del quinto día. Esto es especialmente importante si usted mismo o alguien con quien vive tiene un mayor riesgo de enfermarse. La, excep la excepción a esto son aquellos que se recuperaron recientemente del COVID-19. Para estas personas, no se recomienda la prueba a menos que desarrollen síntomas. Next slide, please. Para cerrar hoy, queremos reconocer lo difícil que es averiguar qué es lo mejor que se puede hacer cuando tantos se están infectando. Y aunque tenemos herramientas que ayudan, existe una creciente frustración por los cambios aparentemente interminables en la orientación, la escasez de pruebas y la realidad de que las personas vacunadas y con refuerzo uh, también pueden infectarse. Dado que esta es una, una eh, evaluación precisa de nuestra realidad actual, probablemente haremos mejor en recordarnos que hemos sobrevivido a desafíos similares varias veces durante los últimos dos años. Y aunque no es donde esperábamos estar, eh, necesitaremos retomar la fuerza y continuar haciendo todo lo posible para frenar la propagación. Es demasiado arriesgado para muchas personas eh, no continuar tomando precauciones y tomando decisiones estratégicas para minimizar las exposiciones innecesarias. 
Necesitamos que nuestras escuelas y lugares de trabajo permanezcan abiertos y esto es más importante si continuamos trabajando juntos. Para empezar, todavía hay tiempo para vacunarse y recibir el refuerzo. Por favor, no se demore más. Con altos niveles de contagio, vacunarse y recibir el refuerzo cuando sea el momento es una de las mejores maneras de protegerse del COVID y ayudar a frenar la propagación. Las personas no vacunadas tienen entre dos y cuatro veces más probabilidades de infectarse que las vacunadas y las vacunadas con refuerzo. Dados los altos índices de contagio, Contagio, usar una mejor mascarilla con buen ajuste y filtración también agregará una capa de protección. N95, KN95 y KF94, KF94, perdón, son los mejores cuando se trata de bloquear las partículas del virus COVID, pero las mascarillas médicas o quirúrgicas también funcionan bien y el cubrebocas de tela sigue siendo mucho mejor que ninguna mascarilla. Les hemos pedido a todos que limiten actividades no esenciales donde el riesgo de contagio es alto. Estas incluyen no usar mascarilla en eventos en interiores y llenos de gente. Y aunque las pruebas son escasas, es importante que aquellos con síntomas o una exposición conocida traten de encontrar una manera de hacerse la prueba. Puede visitar covid 19 la county.gov para encontrar un sitio de prueba y si da positivo nuevamente puede llamar a salud pública al 833-540-0473 los 7 días de la semana entre las 8 de la mañana y las 8 y 30 de la noche si necesita recursos o ayuda. Muchas gracias y hasta la próxima. So much, Monica. As a reminder, if you have questions for us, you can send them to our media inbox at media at ph.lacounty.gov. And thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week.